the rest of us, we will be going to um, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. So normally we, we kind of just been trekking through the Old Testament, right? We, <clears throat> we've been moving through and we found ourselves in the fifth book, <clears throat> in Deuteronomy, of the of the what, what's you know what's called your your Torah or your um, you know the books of Moses, the Pentateuch, and the five books, the five <clears throat> words, and and when you get into Deuteronomy, the setting of Deuteronomy is again it's sitting right before they go into the Promised Land right after the 40 years of, of, of judgment, you know, so they come out of Egypt, right? They go into, the, into that Mount Sinai moment. All the fire and all those things kind of happen. The words are said, the Ten Commandments, right, are given by the voice of God. The people say, Moses, you go, get, you go get it. You go hear God because it's too hard to hear him for us. We're going to die. Moses goes up, comes back with the tablets of stone, right, the Ten Commandments, they're already breaking commandments, so he breaks the tablets when he comes down. That's how far they got, right? On, on man's side, that's kind of our, 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 our great work right there in a picture. But, but the Lord is gracious, right? Does what? Another Ten Commandments on stone. Um, the people go uh, through the wilderness, the tabernacle, all those things are set up, and they end up at the promised land only to reject going in, and then they're dejected from God, given judgment for that generation. This new generation is raised up, right? The 600,000-man army is ready to go, about the same amount of guys that <clears throat> were there the first time, right? And now this this word is for them. And so he's been talking about the histories, and now he's kind of moving to the basic commandments that as they go into the land, so Moses is given basically the sermon and then what is commonly called the commands. And, and, and so it starts with the basic commands, which was the Ten Commands. We did that last week, the, the Ten Commandments. Saw the, the couple of differences, but pretty much straight, like the same as they were given in Exodus 20. And now we move to what's kind of the, the greatest commandment. And, and that's where Jesus had noted that's the greatest commandment and we're going to get into that, but we're only going to get to nine verses tonight. Normally, we do a chapter, and there's only 25 in this chapter, but as I was working through it, um, it's probably one of the most important, um, you know, commands given throughout the, the scriptures, um, and I think, I think it's worthy of our time to just kind of just sit in it for a minute. So if you don't mind, we're going to kind of slow down just for a minute. <clears throat> we'll get back rolling next week, um, but I think looking at this principal commandment. And I think it's, it's, it's tied to like our vision of the church is lo- loving God, loving others, and making disciples. And, and, and I think to understand the lo- to love God, what that looks like, what it means, and this is where Jesus pulls it as the greatest commandment itself. So let's go ahead and read uh, verses 1 through 9 of chapter 6, and then we'll, we'll break it down. All right, so it says, Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you should observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes, his uh, commandments, which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Um, Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that, you, that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house 
and on your gates. And so, Father, again, we thank you for this text. Would you help us, Lord, as we dig into it, as we break it down, and as we may try to make sense, Lord, just of how, Lord, is this possible for us to keep this? Lord, just as it was, how was it possible for them to keep it? Lord, as you reinstituted it, as you recapitulated it to us, Lord, to the, your people, to those following you, Lord, how is it possible? And so, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that, that, that you wouldn't give it if you didn't think it was possible for us. And we're thankful, Lord, that as you gave it, you gave the provisions necessary. So help us tonight as we look here, Lord, as we break it open, Lord, to receive from you. And we just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So he starts off there in verse 1. He says, now this is the commandment, right? Now this is the commandment. And these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you. He had before was talking about what God had done, what God had said. God had given them the Ten Commandments. And as he gives his little sermon about the Ten Commandments, he reflects back and says, look, this was what was given to you then, right? And he, and he kind of tweaks a couple of the passages just so that they could see how, how he would emphasize and how important these things were for them. But now he says, this is the commandment, right? And these are the statutes which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you. And, and this you is a plural you. And the reason why I even bring that up <clears throat> is this first verse, the yous and the yours are all plural. So he's talking to them as a group. Then when he moves into second, third, and then the rest, he talks to them in a singular sense. And so it gets very personal. It moves from the group and the whole, and then he speaks very personally to this group. And so notice he goes on there in the second half of verse 1. He says, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess. Right? So these are for you to observe in the land. Right? Because the other commands were for general. Right? These are given for all time in all places but specifically, these are for you guys when you go into that land, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life. And then he gives the reason that your days may be prolonged. Right? These are for them to continue to keep in, to obey, to right? And we talked a little bit about how commandments work in the sense of restrictions, Right? They, they cause a certain amount of restrictions right? so that true freedom could be actually had because doing whatever you want isn't true freedom. Doing whatever you want creates chaos in a society, but, but true freedom comes with the right restrictions, right? with the right things that you do and don't do. And so this true freedom is now giving to them through the commands. And the commands are there that they would be able to teach uh, and pass them on to their kids, right, and to their grandchildren so that they would stay long in the land. That's the big goal, right, that they would continue long in the land, right, that they wouldn't get booted out quick, you know. Why? Well, it's very clear is they couldn't even keep the command until Moses went up and got the, you know, the Ten Commandments on stone and came down. So he knew they were stiff-necked people, and so these commands were there to, to help them. And a lot of times people see commandments as controllers, rather than seeing commandments as a way of, of, of really setting you free from the things that hinder you. So, so anyways, God comes, lays it out to them. Um, the, the idea and the picture there of the fear of God, right, you know, points to the reality as recognizing to have someone who should be the highest authority, right? You know, I think in, when you get into, like, uh, addiction groups and stuff, they talk about having a higher power, right? You need something greater than yourself, something bigger than yourself, something that's, you know, you know but, but this speaks of something the greatest. What is the greatest, right? What is that which you should fear the most? And, and God is to be feared, but also respected, but also enjoyed in relationship. Because if you have relationship with him, then you can get close to him. And that's what this law, and we're going to get into the the Shema, right? I'll, I'll talk about the Shema. That's a fun thing to say. It's a Hebrew word. And, uh, but, but, but we'll see how that works, how, how God could be feared, but also in relationship with us. Um, now, this was 
he, he goes and tells them, therefore, hear, O Israel, right, to be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that it may, you may multiply greatly as the Lord your fathers has promised you. And so through their careful observation of the commands and the statutes and, and all these things that were given to them, right, would cause for them to fulfill the promise and growing and multiplying and having many, you know, they would, they would be prospered in that way. And, and then ultimately that, that, that he what, would give that promised land to them, right? A land what? Flowing with milk and honey, right? I like that picture of a land flowing with milk and honey. Um, and a lot of times think, well, that would be a lot of bees, right? But you always have to think about it <clears throat> is that it may not be necessarily talking about honey bee honey because a lot of times they would refer to honey as being from dates, right? And if you go to the Holy Land, it's a place for dates. And, and so date honey was huge in the land and such. There's, there's different views that people take on it. But this was a well-known way of saying you know, a blessing and all those things. And it was a, it was a, it was a continual um, thing that was communicated over and over and over again, um, not only in Israel, but that phrase was outside of Israel. Um, other, other people used it as, that, that's an amazing property you have there. It's like a land flowing with milk and rivers of honey. So um, it was, it, for them, they knew exactly what kind of land that was. And, and remember when the first group arrived, they went in, they sent spies in. They couldn't say that it wasn't like that. They said it was exactly as the Lord said, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they brought back a cluster of grapes and they were huge, right, grapes and took men pick, um, holding them on poles to carry them back because they were so big. <clears throat> and so, so we have here uh, now moving into verse 4. And, and, and the first two verses are what are known as traditionally the Shema, but 6, 4 through 9 is also known as the holistic Shema. <laughs> and Shema literally just means hear, right? So the first word, hear, right? Listen, you know, and, I, and I, as I spoke before and last week is, hey, you need to know that, um, you know, that, that Deuteronomy is meant to be heard, right? And so if you ever struggle just reading it, get it on audio and listen to it and picture the place and how it's been given as Moses is about to give it to these people going into the promised land. Well, here, this is the imperative of the command. It's the only command in this text is here. Here, <laughs> O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, right? When you get into this first verse, I think just breaking it down word by word is worthy of the text, um, and, and so if some of it's redundant, I'm sorry if you've heard it before, but not everybody's heard um, the word on this. But, but he starts off, and obviously here is to listen, to pay attention, you know, prepare yourself to heed this, to take it in, you know. And, and, and that's, he wants them to really lean in. And then he directly goes to them and he says, Hear, O Israel. So he speaks to them, right? And he calls them by name. And he directs it to them as Israel. Now, who is Israel exactly? Israel, we know, is the nation, right? The nation of Israel, the 600 men there that are the warriors and their families. Um, but they're also a people that come from a man whose name was Jacob that became Israel. And understanding this, this background of his name and who he is and what that means for them, I think, is important. Um, we know in Genesis 32 that, that Jacob, who was at one time, he's basically known as the, the cat, heel catcher, a supplanter. That's what his name means. He was a cheater, right? And he was stealing his brother's uh, blessing and, 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 and used a bad situation to sell, uh, buy the birthright of his brother for a cup of stew, you know? Jacob was that dude. <laughs> and, 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 he, and, he, and he ripped off Esau, um, in a couple ways. And, and so being that heel catcher in that thing, he, he ends up in this relationship with God. And, and through his story, he has to run away right afterwards because right, his big hairy brother is going to beat him up. And he's out of there. He thinks he's going to get killed for it. His mom sends him back to her brother, his uncle, to go marry and find wives from their family. And, um, 
And then he's on his way back years later, and he's got this huge, you know, cattle. God had really blessed this young man with all this stuff. Now he's older. He's got all these kids, right? And, and as he's coming back into the land, he ends up seeing God face to face and wrestles with him, you know, as a man wrestles with a man, right? And a lot of people look at that, and they, and they always are confused because a lot of people say, well, he wrestled with him, and then God poked him in the, in the hip, beat him, and, and brought him into submission. But that's not how the story goes. That's how I always thought it was until I'd studied and read it and understood it better. And, and it literally means you know, that he, 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 he wrestled with God, and, 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 and in that moment, right, and it's a theophany, and God shows himself in, in a human form, and he, he wrestles with him in such a way that ends up where he says, you know, like, I will not let you go until you bless me. And, 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 and so the Lord says, he does touch him in the hip, <laughs> but he says, Jacob, now you're, you're Israel now. You have prevailed with God. That's what it means to prevail, to, um, <clears throat> to, to overcome so he became an overcomer. So no longer was he cheating. He took it face on, and he wrestled with God and prevailed. And so he became a prevailer or an overcomer. You know? and, and so, he, so, so when he says, hear, O Israel, he's saying to them that they are overcomers, that they are Israel, right? And, and as he speaks to them and ties them back to their, you know, patronage, you know, their fathers, you know, he's ultimately going to, to, to deal with this one who struggled with God and prevailed, and, and now uh, they're ready to go in, that they are overcomers that are about to go into the land. So he says, hero Israel, so he says to them who they are, now he's going to say, the Lord our God, right? And, and we understand that as, as the Lord is what we would transliterate Y-H-W-H. Um, you know, that's the Hebrew letters that correlate over, you know, to the English letters is Y-H-W-H. And, and it's, but you're never going to see that in like the New King James, the King James, most of the regular translations. Every once in a while you'll see some translations, like the ASV has um, Jehovah, you will see that name sometimes. I think the old Holman Christian Standard was using Yahweh, um, but but I think it's 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 worthy again time right to just explain why it says the Lord and why it's okay for your Bible to say the Lord and not have Y H W H there, and I and, and the reason why that might be helpful to you is just to understand how it happened how it went down. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but I think it, so for whatever reason in ancient Hebrews, they, you know, coming off the Ten Commandments, you said, you shall not use the Lord your God, his name in vain, right? Do you know the best way to not use his name in vain? Not to use his name at all. And somewhere along the line, one rabbi came up with this idea, I guess, and then it became tradition, and pretty soon they just would not speak the name. But then there came this moment. There would be this moment, and they would have this moment, and they would shut it down, and, you know, they we're not going to do this. But then they, they decided, how do we recite the scriptures that have the name in, in there? And so somebody decided, every time we have this cited, and we have to re repeat this or say this out loud, it needs to be said, Adonai, which is Lord, Right? That's a Hebrew word for Lord. So every time they would say the name, they changed it to Lord. Right? And, and then, so you fast forward some history. We don't know when it happened, when it fell out. But what happened was, is over time we lost the pronunciation. We don't know how to pronounce it. All we have is, um, you know, these four consonants. Um, we don't have the vowels to understand how it should have been said and, and, and such. Um, so with that, you end up losing, um, you end up losing the like the way to the pronunciation. Now you have the problem is is if you tried to pronounce it, do you want to get his name wrong? Uh oh, that's a problem, right? 
because because boy, out of reverence, you don't want to say the wrong name. And so there's this confusion that kind of happens. So when they were putting together the, they call this the Septuagint, which speaks of the 70 translators that changed the Hebrew Bible into the Greek Bible in about the second century BC. They, when they translated the divine name, they translated it Kyrios, which is Lord in Greek. And so that translation had Kyrios, which is Lord. And, and so, so for the people, the Greek-speaking Jews that read it and stuff, it was just in their Bible that way. And then when the New Testament came in, right, in those times and was written, they used Kyrios as well. Now that creates problems a little bit because Kyrios can be Lord or it can mean like YHWH, right? And so you have to be, you know, you have to do your studies on that a little bit. But it makes sense when you get to that place when using the divine name, um, you know. And so we say, well, we should go back and try to fix that because that would be right. That's just how we, th- I, I used to think that all the time. So why don't they fix that? If it's in the Hebrew this way, it ought to be this way, right? Um, Jerome, who is in the fourth century, about 400 years after Christ, he, he comes and he translates the um, Old and New Testament. He, he translates it from the Hebrew and Greek into Latin, which was the day and age of the Roman. Christian Roman Empire was getting formulated, getting rolling, right? So all these Christians have become the Roman state, you know, the, you know, the world powers, state religion. Jerome's commissioned. It was two ladies that did most of the translating, uh, Paula, St. Paula, I can't remember the other gal's name. So I, I love the story, though. And if you ever get a chance to ever get back to Bethlehem, right now is not the time, probably, <laughs> right? Because it's in the Palestinian authority and stuff. But, but when I got went in 2012, that was one of my favorite places to go is there's this little office, but it's a cave, <laughs> you know, down below the church of where, uh, where, where Christ was you know, born. They built churches all over the place in there. It looks like the Pope throw up everywhere, and it's all kind of crazy. But when you get in there, you go down, and there's this little cave, and they have this real beautiful fresco, this great painting with um, um, with Paula and the other gal there who did all this heavy work of translating from the the Hebrew uh, and, the, uh, and the Greeks over to Latin. Um, it's pretty cool. But with this Jerome, guess what he used? He translated all the divine names from the Hebrew, Domina, Dominus, which is Lord. <laughs> so he could have corrected it. They could have corrected it in that moment, and we would have probably all had a, a, a certain thing and such, but they didn't. And so I think what was held there, now modern Hebrews and Jews, they have complications, so they'll write Hashem, which is the name, right? And they'll write God with like a dash between G dash D because they're, they're still in that weird religious sense of like, we can't say the name, we can't say the name and, and such. But I think if you just kind of understand the background of how it is with the Lord, you know, the, and, and it's actually going to get here in a moment, is the reality is the Lord is one in the sense that he's not separate. And so when you get into the name of God, I don't think I would put too much weight on Jehovah, which is using the vowels of Adonai in the consonants of YHWH. I wouldn't, I, you know, a lot of people say Yahweh. That's a modern day scholarship saying that's the best we could come up with. Is it? I don't know, you know, like, so I just, when I write it or do anything, it's just YHWH. The Tetragrammatron, it's a... Anyways, you can spend hours and read books on it. I think it comes together, though, when you get into the fact of Jesus Christ, right? The Jesus, which is translated, you know, and transliterated over for us, which was from the Hebrew Yeshua, right? right? And, and Yeshua is the name that, what? Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, Right? above, under, right? His name is the name that's going to be in. He is Kyrios. In fact, you cannot be a Christian and you don't have the Holy Spirit if you can't say Jesus is Kyrios, which is what? The divine name. 
So, so you, you run into these, these moments, and then you kind of say, okay, I get it now. God has this plan, and he's bringing together this reality of, of our Lord. Um, there's a word called ineffable. And ineffable, right, it, it's a word that says incapable of being expressed in words. So some of our traditional hymns, they used to say, you know, that God is being, he, he is ineffably sublime, you know. You, there's not words to describe our God. Um, as well as we, you know, we can't really describe his essence, right? And then the name of God is one who is infinite, right? So how do you describe someone who is infinite with finite words? You know, and, you've, and you run into these issues um, a lot um, when you try to break down. When you go back to the original and you try to like, really pin out uh, like the name when it's presented to Moses in Exodus 3. Because what happens is the, the divine name is something that, is, you know, that it just points us to, to something greater and then we can understand. And, and, it, and it points to this idea that he's imminent, right? And that means he's close to us. And we get that from when he was with, with Moses. Um, in Exodus 3, verses 11 and 12, Moses says to God, is, well, who am I supposed to tell you, Pharaoh, that, who sent me, right? And, and he tells him, you know, just, you know, just tell him, you know, that, that I am sent you, right? Or I am with you that sent you. Right? And that's this idea, I, uh, you know. And, and, and this, this idea that he's with us, right? You have to keep in mind that, you know, that, that, that God is with us. He's present with us. And, you know, and Moses needed to know that he's with him. Just tell him I'm with you. Right? So when you show up to Pharaoh and he says, Who, who's your God again? Say, he's with me. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, like, just tell him that. And, and that I am is with you, you know, is the idea. It goes on, and, and he says, well, what if I tell the Israelites? Who do I say that, you know, who do I tell them? And he says, well, tell them the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Well, what's the God of our father's name? What do I tell them? And he says, I am who I am, <laughs> right? And, and this idea is that, that he's with us, and he is who he is, <laughs> you know? And that's the idea of imminence, that he's with us. He's close, right? And he's close to Israel. He's close to, to Moses. He's close to his people. Um, when we think of Jesus, right, who is, after all, Kyrios, Lord, you know, he's the Lord incarnate. He's the one, he's the Lord put on flesh. He is the Yahweh or the Jehovah or the YHWH of the Old Testament, the Adonai, who is put on flesh. He has come, right? And he, what, is the perfect reality of his name, right? That's why he is called what? Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And so his presence is with us. And, and, and so, you know, and so it just kind of like John's gospel works to a point, to point to this reality of these two facets where Thomas, right, I won't believe until I put my fingers in his, the nail prints in his hands and my hand in his side. I, I just won't believe until that time. And, and, and then what, what is Thomas? Thomas, here, put your hands here and put your hand to my side, you know. And Thomas falls on his knees in John uh, 20, 28. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Kyrios and theos, right? He brings these two together and points to Jesus and says that's who, who he is. So the Lord, right? So we got one more word, right? Hero Israel, the Lord, our God, all right? So, so we're going into our God, right? Our God points to this reality. Of, you know, Elohim is an Old Testament word that, that it, 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 it can mean a singular but also a plural group of gods. So God or gods, Translated in your Bible, one or the other, depending on the context. Um, it's, just, it's kind of the placeholder for this, this, this term. Whereas, the, but the idea of God, right, or Elohim points to 
heavenly, whereas Adam, which means earth, right, points to the to earthly. So people are not what? Gods, because we are earthly, right? And he is heavenly, right? Gods are heavenly. And so that, that's the, the basics of the Hebrew. And, and, and in those names, it, it, it pushes force towards the transcendence over the qualities of human, um, that he's in more immortality and full of power in that way. And so the Lord our God, when we, when we look at it, it, this points to imminence. That's another big fun word, right? And imminence, so, you know, being close to us, right? We, we love this. And then, then there's another word that goes transcendence. That means he is out of our grasp. He is beyond us, greater than in all ways. And we're referring to the fact that God goes beyond anything we can think or imagine. And so when we are saying the Lord who is imminently with us, he's the I am that's with you, Israel, our God who is transcendent, he's out there. He is beyond what you can imagine, right? And so everybody has some form of God, right? Whether they make themselves out to be God, or some thing to be God, or it's their ultimate. It's whatever their ultimate is that's beyond, in a sense. Um, and, and I think, you know, when we think of this picture, so we have, and let me just give you this quote. He says, so we have Adonai, the Lord, the God who is close, and we have Elohim transcendence, the God who is far away. And I think what this brings us and all of this to say is that when we hear this, it says the God who is far away has become close to us. To those who are what? A Jacob who have now become overcomers in God. And you need to hear this first. And that shows that this relationship and covenant is from a God who's come and close to you, which is love. He's moving towards us in love. And, and, and so when God says, listen very carefully, there's something I want you to understand, right? First thing, your name's Israel, right? But then he's like, but my name, right? I'm the Lord your God. And so when he says he's the transcendent one, right, it's because he's close now. And he wants him to see, see and recognize that. Now, when I was studying this, I kept thinking about, you know, just how amazing it is that when Jesus points to the reality of the, the greatest commandment, he starts with the Shema. He doesn't just say, love your Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He says, hear, O Israel, the Lord, right, our God, the Lord, he is one. You shall love the Lord your God. He gives the whole package. And I think you can never love God, which is the command we're leading to, until you see that he loves you, that he's the one that loves the Jacobs and make, makes them overcomers. He's the one that loves us so much, right, that he wants to be in a covenant relationship with us. And that just pictures the coming of Jesus Christ in such a beautiful way that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, right? Like, that, it, it's, it's quite unique. Now, the Lord is one. That's the last part of this little verse. You're like, boy, that was a one, half a verse through. Yay. <laughs> the Lord is one, right? Right, so again, the divine name is one. So it's, that which distinguishes him, he points to this reality of this one. Ikad is the word there. Ikad could be used in, it's, it's driven by its context. In this case, it's difficult, but in the context of the word, it could mean like when they brought what? An akkad of grapes, right? A cluster of grapes that was one cluster of grapes, one akkad. So it could have um, has the form of plurality within a unit. That's one of the ways. Um, it could be distinguishing one in the sense of just, just one, only one. It could also mean, uh, you know, the one and only right? That he alone is God. That, that might be a, a translation that, as it's used in different places. And so the Lord alone, right, or the Lord is one, 
You know, you'll see it, in, and it's out there in a couple of different translations, but it contains both of the senses of exclusivity of relationship and unity of character. And I think that's why the translation, the way it's worded, it has a, a fuller, more, um, in, you know, more packed in meaning. And so how many is God? Is that what this text is about? I don't think it's about that, right? Because I think it's about him alone being God. And we get that in the New Testament, actually. If you turn over with me real quickly to Matthew or Mark, Mark chapter 12. And I love that the Bible interprets the Bible, so that kind of helps us, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. All right, Mark chapter 12. In verse 28, it says, then, then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him and said, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth. For there is one God, and there is no other but he. So, so this kind of gives you that picture of the meaning of the one is being that there's no other but he. So he is God alone in that way. Um, and then it goes on in verse 33, it says, and to love him with all your heart and with all your understanding, with all your soul and with all your strength and, the lo- and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offering and sacrifices. Now, when Jesus saw that, that, that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God, but after this, no one dared question him. And so, Jesus is schooling the scribe, right? The leader, you know, these guys that are the smart dudes. And, and he's just laying out the facts, you know, the reality, you know, that this is the greatest commandment. And it does provide for what? All, more than all the sacrifices and all those things and such. And so when we think of God being one, it does, it, it, it does point to the reality that that we, sh- we are only attached to him and he is alone. He alone. And, and I think Jesus says it great in his great high priestly prayer in John 17. You know, he says, and this is eternal life. The one, you are the one true God, right? And, and, you know, and, and, and so, and yet within that, it still has what? Room in the akkad form for a plurality in a unit. So you could still have room for the, three persons, and there's lots on that. We don't want to get into that tonight. But I think it's important just to recognize that, that, that what makes a true Israelite who's hearing this message from Moses is that the Lord is your God, and he's your God alone. He is your one God. And, and, and to their shame, Israel would go on, and you would hear about the Yahweh of Timon and the Yahweh of, uh, of these different places, and, and I think it's just important that we recognize that, um, you know, the idea of these, the Yahweh of Samaria and all these Yahwehs and stuff, they were not keeping the unity, right, of their God in a singular way. And he had one what? He had one tabernacle that became a singular temple, a singular altar, you know, and the oneness of God is so crucial in that unity. And so... Um, and this differs from what? All those pagan, you know, gods of their day, because they're the god of the mountain, the god of the sun. You know, they had this whole formulation of the many gods and such. Um, there was a few of them that had a h- higher god than all the other gods, which kind of points to similar to like, you know, our god and the angelic or the divine realm. Um, and there would all be Elohims, if you will, in that sense. But but the, the bigger picture is is, for Israel and for them, they needed to recognize they had one God. 
right? And he alone, right, is their God. Um, you know, I think today, like with Mormonism, which spreads out, um, they don't talk about it much, but it does point to um, a God who had a father, and that God had a father, and that God had a father, and that God had a father, which um, becomes a problem. There's the call the Kalam theory where you can't have an ongoing thing for eternity backwards like that. You could do a mathematical equation and divide backwards forever, but you cannot ever get to today if you don't have a beginning. And so you have, so it doesn't work unless you have one self-existent eternal God who has existed from all existence, you know, from all time, you know, before time, creates time, creates everything, and brings us to today. So, so we have some pretty cool things about our God. He's our first cause. He alone, right, has created all things. He alone, you know, um, and yet within himself, he has three persons, and so he's relational. He doesn't need us to have relationship like Allah, the, the, the Islamic God, needs his creation to have relationships, right? He needs angelic beings. He needs all the beings to be in relationship where our God doesn't need those things, um, and Jesus Christ, he is what? The same yesterday, today, and forever, right? And, and I love that passage as well. So he's a trustworthy God. Because the Lord is one, he is faithful. And because the Lord is one, you can rely on him, right? Because he's everything. He's both transcendent, but he's also close. And then it goes on there. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And because the Lord our God is one and alone, we must be one and alone in our love. We must be single in our love. We must, you know, you shall love the Lord all your, with all, your, uh, with all your, 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 your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, you know. It gives the idea of your inner being, your whole body, and with all your resources. This is where it gets tricky, yeah. The loving God with everything. So what do I get to keep for myself? <laughs> well, you get the Lord. <laughs> you know, that's the idea. You know, and, and, and I think one of the things is that's the most important thing that we do is once we see that we have a God who loves us, the natural response is to love him. And what I found is if I try to love my wife more than my God, I will, not, I will fail in my marriage. That will put too much pressure on her. You know, if you over pedestal people, right? If you pedestal a pastor, you're setting them up for failure, right? You look him up, he's got to be, you know, like, boy, he's just a dude. <laughs> he's just a man. Yeah. You know? If you do that with a spouse, if you do that with your kids, if you make it all about the kids and you have a kid centered home, watch out, right? Because you're setting them up. They can't handle that kind of pressure. They're not in a position to be. God. And if you love anything more than God, you are setting that up for failure. You're setting that up for, for, for difficulties and yourself up. And so God has to be the ultimate. And, and, this, and the way it works is, is I go to God because he loves me and he, is, he can handle it and he can handle the praise, but he can also handle right the mess. And, and the beauty is, is that, that he's not going to let us down but he will redirect us. And guess what he tells me to do with my wife? Love your wife like, right? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, right? Fathers, don't provoke your children, right? But train them in the admonition of the Lord, right? There's this redirection through his commands that makes all these things, relationships right for us. But if we don't keep God front and center and love him wholly, and make sure that that's the one that's given us the commands. That's the one whom we can fear and what? Be in relationship with ultimately because he's going to tell us to have, how to have right relationships with each other, how to hold stuff, how to hold relationships, right? How to hold those things. And, and I, think, I think the more we, we operate in that direction, um, it takes a lot of pressure off of relationships. It takes a lot of pressure off how you, you know, you're not setting people up to fail in your head all day, right? And what do you expect for sinners? Probably they're probably, I'm not saying you will, but they're probably going to probably sin at some point. Let me down some way, right? 
But then the Bible commands me to what? Love you anyways, right? And what does love do? It hopes all things. I hope they don't. I'm going to believe that they're not going to. Why? Because God tells me to love, and he gives me the love for them to do that, right? But if I go, oh, that person is rock solid. They'll never fail. I could build my life on them. Watch out. (laughs) That's what destroys our trust and all those things. And so we have to fully depend on the one who is worthy, that can handle it, right? Who's the rock, the solid one, right? And so and, and so this is an exclusivity of, of our love first. That means the first love goes to him, to love him with all of our first, right? All that singleness of, of love for him and trust that he will give us the right amount to, to you know, because then if I love my wife, you know, I can love her on a good day and a bad day, on her best day and her worst day. Why? Because Jesus is always worthy to obey, Right? When men are not respectable, but the husband says, respect your husbands, right? right? Because Jesus is always worthy of your respect, whether the dude is or not. And I, and I think that's what moves us into those beautiful places. In John 14, 21, it says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will love, uh, be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So when we think of love, don't just think of like a, ooh, I just love God. He's so cute, or, like, or whatever kind of emotional. Or he, You can have an emotional love, but it needs to be followed up with a action of relationship. It needs to be more volitionally driven, like I'm choosing to do your will, oh God. I'm choosing, and, and, and so... Um, so it's through relational obedience. It's obeying because of the relationship and covenant that is made. Because of what he's done for me, therefore I what? I serve him. Because of who he is, I worship him. You know? and, and, so, and so Jesus says, oh, you could say you love me all day long, but only those who have my commandments and keeps them. It is they who love me. So he qualifies and says, so when we talk about loving God, it's through what? Right? Obedience. Do you see how it's kind, of, it's kind of a system? God says, love me, and how do I love you? Well, I love everybody. Right? And that's why Jesus says what? The second commandment's like it, isn't it? To love your neighbor as yourself. You can't get away from those, those two commands because they're cyclical in a sense. They tie together. You, can't get, you just can't, you can't say you love God and hate your brother. You can't do it. It's just impossible because God commands you to what? To love your brother. And if you don't love your brother, you're not loving God. It, 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 it's, it's kind of frustrating. And yet at the same time, it's very comforting. Because once you embrace it and you see it, then you start to go, okay. God knows what he's doing. He knows that person. And he wants me to love them. Okay, you're worthy. So... to love him with all these things, right? Now, they're broken up into different ways, but it it just has to do with the inward, right, of the person, the entire inner person, both the the mind, right, the soul of you, the the heart could be multiple kind of pictures from the Old Testament views. In the New Testament, it's separated out. You know, you have the heart, mind, soul, and strength that Jesus gives, I think, describes it in a greater way. Um. And then we have this reality of, um, you know, the fact that if, if we really make him first and single in our lives, um, you know, it'll be well with us. Um, in verse 6, let's just look at these last few. It says, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Shall, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. And so here uh, now is that, that it's shown with each of the households how it needs to roll out, right? So it's a personal matter. Remember, these are all singular. This is all for you, he says. Like, you got you and you and you and you and you and you, but you. So you, 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 he says, you know, that these commands shall be where? 
in your heart, right? But then they don't stay there, do they? What did Jesus teach us about the heart? Out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks, right? And so if you're really overflowing in your heart, it's going to be in your words, right? And I love the picture of like what worship is, right? What you worship, you know, it's going to be whatever you're thinking about the most, whatever you're speaking about the most, and whatever you're doing the most. If it's connected to your actions and your thoughts and your speech, that's what you worship, right? If football is my God, what am I going to think about? Football, you know? What am I going to talk about? Football, you know? What do I want to do all the time? Watch football now, you know, when you're older. But when I was in high school, my mom said it, and I had a shirt that said, football is life, and the rest is just details. And my mom says, you're an idol worshiper. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not, you know. She was right, and I was wrong. And so, so from there, it moves from the personal to where? The family, right? Teach. Teach your children, right? You shall teach them diligently to your children. So don't like not half butt it kind of thing, not half, you know, you don't, it's not like, ah, kind of do it, you know. I need to do it in such a way with diligence. I need to be after it, you know. And, and if you're a parent, you know that there's two kind of ways we could do it at times. Sometimes we can get sidetracked. Right? So when the kids down the hall, they're no longer what? Ministry. They're possessions. Because now you're, you could tell you when you're in ministry and it's a possession, right? Is if it's a possession, oh, they're wasting my time now. They're getting in my way, you know, rather than, oh, I guess I got to go minister to my kids. If they belong to him, they're ministry. If they belong to me, you know, there's that tendency. And, and it's hard. But I think when we're doing it, you know, because you can get tired, but, but diligence with the Lord, right? It's, it's hard enough just doing the regular keeping the peace in the home sometimes, but diligently teach them. So they're told to take it diligently to their children. And how do they do that? Well, you shall talk of, it, of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. And, and so these are the sitting down and the rising up, right? I mean, the sitting down and the walking, by the way, the lying down and the rising up, it's a funny word, merism. It's two examples of a figure of speech, right, of merism. Moses uses them to sit and walk and to lie down and rise, right? In Genesis 1, right, in the beginning, God created what? The heavens and the earth, right? And, and the idea is what? And everything in between. That, that's, the, that's a merism, Right? So to sit and to walk means what? You know, like when you're sitting and walking and all the time between that, right? When you rise up and you lie down and all the time between that, that that's what he's kind of getting at. And so, so to, to love God is to, to teach those to your family, right? In your own heart, to your family as you go, in your home, but also on the way, right? On the way, out there, right? And, and so in verse 8, he moves it a little further because it's not only personal, it's not only family, but also you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be frontlets on your, um, between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So this means that our, our faith and their faith specifically was not to just be an inside faith. It was to be public. And so it's, it's a public thing, right? You know that commercial it's like you know which card do you use you know what's in your po- in your in your wallet what's in your pocket or whatever right you know we're to be carrying the the words and the commands is you know is the idea it's communal matters right the sign on your hands and the front lips of your eyes the doorposts of your house and your gates and so whatever's meant of this the Jews of this day they literally like wear like little things on their they put their little box up here on the front lips of their eyes right they bind these the things, the phylacteries and these things on their hands and such. And so they would do it in a literal way to remind them of these things, right? Mezuzahs, right? Metal cases on the edges of their doors, um, little piece of parchments with the text, right? It's, um, that's the most literal translation, right? Or interpretation of it. 
But I think the idea is, is it just needs to be public. You need to be vocal about it. You need to not only talk to your kids, but you need to talk to the guy in town, right? The gates of the city was the, was, was the place where the judges would sit. That's where the major matters of life would happen. Um, you know, they would, you'd have to go to the judge to have any kind of transfer of deeds and those kind of things, um, very public, right? The gates of one's property, kind of same kind of thing. Um, all those, you know, type of matters would take place there. And so God's covenant of people should carry his commands publicly. And, and, and I think for us, I think we just go back to Jesus, right? Right? He's our what? Kyrios and Theos. He's our Lord and God. He's our, he's our one, right? And, and as he tells us in Matthew 5, 13, he says, you, right? And that's all of us. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world, the city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do they uh, light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And I think as Christians, we need to be Christians, right? And yeah, it's the season, right, where people are making voting things and stuff like that. And I think you have to stand for who you are in Christ. You need to vote for who you are in Christ, right? And, and I think it's going to be put to the test. I think some people are going to be challenged. Um, I know candidates are being challenged right now because of certain things that are, you know, culturally pushed around. And I think what you have to do is you have to go out to the world around us and speak the truth of God. But it starts where? In your heart. Do you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Have you received the love that he has for you? Because that's where it starts, because you got to get it from him first. And then as it comes into your heart and you love him and you got right relationships with your people, then you teach, right? And you share, starting at home first and then move to the public space, right? It'd be really bad if you told everybody on a social media platform about your faith, but you didn't tell your own kids exactly how you felt about your love for God. So let's go to prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your great love for us. And Lord, we want to have big ears when the Bible says, listen. And so may we have ears to hear what the Spirit says to us tonight. May we see you as our ultimate, Lord. May we see you as the great one that gives us the commands to know how to operate our lives. And so, Lord, just help us not only to have your commandments, Lord, but to do them because we love you. And we trust you, knowing that your commands are going to be the right restrictions and bring the right kind of freedom. Freedom from sin and self and destruction. Freedom from harm from others. And, and so would you help us, Lord, to, to love more, Lord? And so we, we need to receive that from you because all these things can be done in your spirit, Lord. But we need to be filled with you regularly, constantly, Lord. So as we go out, Lord, we could fill in, Lord, it's not so much the commands that we're focused on, Lord, but may it be Jesus that we teach our children. May it be Jesus, Lord, that we sit up and, and rise up to, Lord, and sit and go out and all the in-betweens, Lord. May it be Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.